Side Hustle Show 259. It's a YouTube roundtable. How three video creators built an audience and a business on YouTube. What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because progress happens just beyond your comfort zone. Awesome show for you today on the topic of YouTube and specifically how three different channel hosts have gone about growing their presence and profits on the YouTube platform, which is is really a unique combination of a search engine and social network. I think it has components of both in there, but definitely a platform that's tough to ignore if you're trying to build a business online. So in this episode, you're going to hear from three esteemed panelists I invited to join me. They are John Shanahan from The Cavalier in thecavalier.net. That's Cavalier with a K in both cases. It's a men's style, a men's fashion channel. You're going to meet uh, Pete Sven from DIY Pete and DIYPete.com. It's a home improvement channel. And Matt Tran from Engineered Truth and EngineeredTruth.com, which is kind of a career advice channel. You'll hear them introduce themselves in just a moment so you can get to know their voices. But my goal here was to showcase three very different approaches to YouTube in terms of content and monetization and also in terms of, you know, where they're at in their journey and audience size. So stick around to hear how these guys have used the free YouTube platform to grow significant followings and significant income streams and their advice on how you can do the same. Notes and links for this one, along with a free downloadable PDF highlight reel summary of this episode, are at sidehustlenation.com slash YouTube panel, all one word. And before we dive in, let me take a moment to thank today's sponsor, Skillshare.com. Skillshare is an online learning community with over 17,000 classes in everything from video editing to social media marketing to web development, all taught by expert practitioners. And what's awesome about Skillshare is you can access their entire class catalog for the price of a couple cups of coffee a month. So why not skip the Netflix tonight and join the millions of students learning and growing on Skillshare today? Absolutely free. That's right. Skillshare is offering Side Hustle Show listeners a free month of unlimited learning. To sign up, visit Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle. Again, that's Skillshare.com slash Side Hustle to claim your free month. This episode is also brought to you by DropshipLifestyle.com. You might remember hearing Anton Crayley, the founder of Dropship Lifestyle, on the show back in episode 189. We talked about why dropshipping was such an attractive business model, how to pick profitable products, and how Anton recommended getting started based on his own experience and from teaching thousands of other people how to do it. Today, I want to invite you to join Anton's completely free 10-day dropshipping mini course, which of course covers a lot more ground than we could in a podcast episode at dropshiplifestyle.com slash hustle. That's dropshiplifestyle.com slash hustle to join the 10-day free course and get started today. I'll be back with my top takeaways from this chat with John, Pete, and Matt after the interview. Ready? Let's do it. John Shanahan from The Cavalier, spelled with a K. I am from Pittsburgh originally. I travel a lot for work, so all over the continental US and Europe. I cover the emerging world of menswear, so a lot of those new upstart brands. I was some of the first reviews or unboxing videos of like Bonobos or Frank and Oak, And I try to both cover menswear from a style perspective, but also from the industry. So we're we're in a very interesting time for retail. So I try to give a little macro view of some of the shifting things in the retail industry. As of today, I am at 17,000 subscribers. And so over this year, it's about tripled since my first video going up in 2015. John, thank you for that. Pete, what about you? My name is Pete Sven. I live out in Bozeman, Montana, and my channel is called DIY Projects with Pete. My website's DIYPete.com. And my channel and site are all about do-it-yourself projects and home improvements. So I make all sorts of things like patio bars, concrete counters, Adirondack chairs, and then I fix things around the home and do renovations. So kind of a lot of different things if you're into doing things with your hands and a maker that's what my channel is geared towards. And I'm at 173,000 right now for subscribers and started January of 2014. Very cool. Pete, Matt, what about you? My channel is called Engineer Truth. They can check it out at youtube.com slash engineered truth or go to my website, engineertruth.com. I help with realistic career information. So what I do is I interview people about their careers to talk about what it's realistically like, the good and the bad. And I also give my own opinion. I started off talking about mechanical engineering because that's what I studied in school. Ended up not liking it. And so now I do YouTube full time. I started in August 2011 as a hobby. And 
now I have 266,000 subscribers. 266,000, you're YouTube celebrity. You guys are all YouTube celebrities compared to me, so I'll take that. I'm curious about the publishing schedule. These types of videos can take a ton of time to produce. So I'm like curious about you know, what that content calendar looks like. Because I know, John, you sent me an email that you're trying to publish every day this year, right? Yeah, I've published for the most part every weekday. And so I'll record a lot on the weekends and then I take the footage with me on my trips. I'll edit them and post them throughout the week because I have like a spray and pray strategy on my videos. So I try to get as many up as possible without doing too many because YouTube does reward you if you have a lot of people that click on your notifications. So I try to find that balance between frequency and then also quality. What do you mean by spray and pray? Just like trying to, well, I'll let you explain it. The main way that I have acquired an audience is through YouTube SEO. So if you search a lot of the brands that I've covered on the channel, I'm the number one search result for there. So I try to cover as many brands as I do in the fashion space. And so trying to make sure I have a video for each brand, or if you hear about a company and you want to know more about it, that's me right there talking about it because I've already bought the product, talked about it and let you know if it's worth your money or not. Okay. Okay. And Pete, how often are you putting out new content? I wish I could put it out every day like John, but <laughs> for me, it's building quite a project. So there's a lot of steps that go along with that. So if I'm maybe making a bar for your patio, you would have to gather the wood, build the project, stain, paint, seal, all of that. So generally at my peak, I've done one video every two weeks. Right now I'm doing about one a month and I want to up that consistency because I know that YouTube rewards you for that as well and it will build the channel so much faster. But right now I'm about once a month for consistency. Okay. What makes you, th is there is there some science to that? Like in how frequently you publish, they kind of reward people who are constantly putting out new stuff? Well, I think so. I mean, I have kind of like a representative that I talk to and he always mentions, you know, if it, you make it more kind of like a TV show where somebody is always waiting for that new episode to come out at 5 p.m. on Thursday, yeah. then they're going to know when to stop back and when to watch and they're going to be fired up about it. Whereas if you're less frequent about things and not consistent, they're going to not stick with you, I don't think as long. So I think just that consistency and like having a time when your episode or a day yeah. is pretty important. Yeah, Nick, I can see a direct correlation. I took a two week vacation, like a family vacation this year. It's the first time I stopped posting on my channel regularly. And I could see a direct dip in the frequency of subscribers and my watch time as when I came back and started posting again. And so it's, I think it's just the way that YouTube determines how relevant is this channel because they are posting new content. And I've heard very similar anecdotes from other YouTube and SEO sites as saying, you got to post more frequently. Okay, interesting. And you do the exact same time every day? Yeah, I try to post at 8 a.m. each day. So I'll schedule, uh, I'll upload and then I'll schedule the post to go live at 8 a.m. Okay. Matt, what's your calendar look like? My calendar is I post one video a week, usually on Thursday or Friday, because I try to get the weekend crowd. Uh, a lot of people are too busy to watch YouTube videos on weekdays. So I feel like Thursday or Friday is the ideal day to post so that you catch everybody that's free on the weekend. I try to post twice a week, but honestly, I just get lazy and it just makes it twice as hard to maintain. For me and for all these guys, we have to make our own vacations. And so like what John was saying, he took a two week vacation and then there's a large gap in his posting. So for me, it's like, okay, I'm going to do one video a week consistently. And I, in some ways I have to create my own vacation. So I may have to create four videos in a row and then schedule it so that I can take a month off and for my lifestyle, I'm a believer in the four hour work week. So I just can't do a 40 hour work week. So one video a week works for me and it works out, you know, and my channel makes a solid, solid income. So I don't have to post too often. Living the dream. We should note that Matt's coming to us from the Philippines right now. So he's on the far other side of the world. It's a very global, a global audience here. I'm curious. So they let you schedule it out. So you could say like, you know, in a little drop down or something like publish this in two weeks. So you could like kind of batch record something. Yeah, you can definitely do that. Or you could just, I have the app. So anytime I'm like, okay, this is a good time to post. And I just go on my app real quick and I hit publish and that's pretty much it. Okay. Okay. How long is a typical video for you, Matt? My typical videos are between 10 minutes to 15 minutes. I found that to be the sweet spot for my audience, but everyone's different. I feel like once someone sees 20 minutes on a YouTube video though, it's in their brain. They usually say, oh, this is too long. And you might click out before even giving it a try. Yeah. Okay. With 10 to 15 minutes, it's still longer than 
I might have expected. I feel like, you know, years ago, it was like, it's got to be under three minutes or something. And I've kind of heard the opposite of that lately, where they seem to be rewarding the total watch times, which is kind of favoring longer videos. John, have you seen similar? Yeah, my average is about seven minutes. So I've got some that are 10 and 12. And then some of them come in around five or six. But it's the watch time, but then also the retention. I've really found that my average retention is somewhere in that eight minute mark. And so I usually try to to cater to that. And it's enough time where I can get into depth in something, but I'm also not rushing. And so I've also found myself watching some YouTube channels that do 20, 30 minute videos. I think the audience kind of self-selects at that point to the people that want to hear more, and it can create that much more of a dedicated audience. It's it's some of the reason I like very long podcasts, and then you become almost friends with the people in a way because you spend so much time with them. Yeah, it's kind of like if your first episode is three hours long, it's like, you know, there's a big hurdle for somebody to come over. But if you're once you've kind of established that relationship, yeah, I'll, I'll tune in for three hours if I, if I really like you. It's a long time for a video, though. It's like to be sitting in front of the screen. It's almost like, okay, this is movie night now. Uh, so kind of the, the watch time plus the retention, like how many people are making it through the end versus just, you know, how many average minutes do they watch? Pete, how long is a, how long is a DIY video of yours? My videos are typically between 8 to 12 minutes. And for footage, I'll have generally between three to five hours total, and then I'll cut that down. So it's not elaborate editing by any means. It's just uh, taking a lot of footage and cutting it down into short clips and then speeding things up. And then I'll do a voiceover at the end. And I found that uh, my watch time in the seven to 12 minute range works out pretty well for my audience. Okay. But you're, you're taking several hours of video and cutting it down to those. Seven, <laughs> like, what is that? edit process. I mean, that sounds really daunting. It's really not too bad because a lot of the times I'll just be out in the garage and sometimes I have somebody helping film. Other times I don't. So I'll just leave the camera rolling and then I just cut it down to clips that I know are going to be important. So if it's a certain cut that I'm making with the miter saw, I'll keep that in. And then, so I can really kind of look when I'm doing the editing process and, and get it down to a short amount of time pretty quickly. And then there's certain things that could be quite repetitive. And so I'll just speed those up. And that way I can get it down to that time. And a lot of people like that. They say, you know, your, your channel is very efficient. We get what we want quickly and then we can get to building. So that's what's worked. Yeah. Kind of the time lapse kind of thing. Like, and here I'm watching my varnish dry or something. Okay. What about the Peter's going to ask you like, you know, what the editing software that you use to kind of piecing, you know, to piece all this stuff together. Cause we talked to Thomas Frank mm-hmm. last year and his videos are really, really highly produced from college info geek. And it's just like, you know, he said he might have for his longest or for his, you know, most in-depth edited video, he said he had like 30 hours into it in terms of production time, editing time for a, you know, what turned out to be like a seven minute video or something like that. Like, I'm curious about the editing process for you. Yeah. And so I know Thomas Frank, I think he uses Adobe Premiere. I've always used Final Cut Pro. That seems to work for me. It's kind of a beefed up iMovie in my view. And I guess it probably takes me on average for your longer video about seven to eight hours to do the editing process. And then usually another hour or so for the voiceover. So it's it's not a, I mean, it It takes a lot of time for sure, but in the end, when you finally ship that product out, it's awesome and super rewarding to get it out on the channel. Okay. Do you guys find, and and maybe John, you can answer this, is like, you know, with a lot of, what do they call it, like jump cuts, where it's like every few seconds, I want to be switching the angle or have like some graphic flying in or some versus just like sitting there, like talking head for seven to 12 minutes. A lot of my videos are just that, where I jump cut really quickly. I think the YouTube audience has adjusted to that because that's how so many of the videos are. I think of like Philip DeFranco. It's like you don't get any breaths. You just cut, go to the next thing, keep the attention. And then also just trying to put in something else to interest the viewer, like a picture or some sort of B-roll. You do want to try and have that be the case. So if somebody wants to put the tab in the background and go do something else, they can listen to you. But if you do have somebody that's interested to watch and keep their attention, in that way. And so I do think there is a lot of value in having those shorter, more to the point conversations. And so trying to cut out rambling or the ums and errs that really helps to make it seem like you put some time into it. Are you on Final Cut as well? 
Yeah, I learned on Final Cut many years ago. I actually went to school for design. And so that was really, I cut my teeth is in there. Okay. I was going to ask like, where do you guys learn how to do this stuff? So you kind of had some, some school background in it, Matt, did you have a, an editing background where you were an engineer? So I imagine you had to like kind of learn this on your own too. Yeah. I use Adobe Premiere Pro. I prefer it. And I think the Adobe Creative Suite, it just integrates well together, but I started off with no knowledge at all. Actually, if you watch my first video on YouTube called the only majors to go to college for I mean, the lighting in it is terrible. The sound quality is terrible. I didn't even know how to make a jump cut at the time. I didn't even know what a jump cut was, to be honest. Maybe you should, what is it? Like explain to you listeners what it is. Because I probably don't know either. It's when you cut out usually an um or a like or a sentence restart or a mistake you made and then there's no transition. So then it just jumps from one cut to another without any transition. So it's really jarring to the eye and it, it generally adds a lot of energy to the feel of the video. And if you watch Philip DeFranco, like John said, or most of the talking head YouTubers, they do it to cut out mistakes. In my opinion, I try to mask it as much as possible. So I'll use like text on the screen or B-roll or image to hide the jump cut to make it not as jarring. My audience personally finds it kind of annoying, but I mean, everyone audience is different. So I try to only put one every 30 seconds or so at the most frequent that has been a good thing for you as far as bringing additional energy to your videos then? Or? I try to avoid jump cuts as much as possible. I only put it in as a necessity. Okay, okay. It doesn't really vibe with my audience. Mm -hmm. I think it vibes with the younger audience, but my, my audience is a little bit more mature. Okay, okay. Okay, so you kind of have longer segments between cuts and graphics and stuff? Yeah, I try, I try to leave longer cuts between just because it's definitely in style, but you know, that's also to a certain point. Like if you do it too much, if you're doing it unnecessarily or... In between sentences, that's the most important thing is for a single cut, you want to put the jump cut at the end of a sentence if you're going to do it, not not in the middle. Otherwise, it's really jarring. Yeah. So Matt, I'm curious between, so from this first video in 2011 with the horrible lighting and the horrible editing, it's like the, the only majors you should go to college for. What have you seen that's grown that subscriber base you know, over the course of six or seven years to the 200,000 plus that you're at today? I think... John touched on this too, and I think a lot of YouTubers who are niche do this accidentally, but we target very specific keywords that don't have a lot of competition. My first popular series was, is blank a good major? So the first one I did was, is mechanical engineering a good major? Is computer science a good major? Is electrical engineering a good major? So I was targeting these keywords, and even if you type mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, or aerospace, or any of the, a lot of college majors, I'll show up as the number one video because I was targeting keywords that aren't so popular on YouTube. Okay. And so that gives you an opportunity as a smaller channel to get that, to actually get some views because you're now you're searchable. And I think that's one of the most key things about being a YouTuber is to make sure you target the specific keywords and rank high only for the keywords that you care about and to make it a sub niche. Like, okay, I'm, I did careers. But within careers, I targeted individual majors within those career information. Okay. So that was the most critical thing. And almost even inside of that, just kind of like engineering majors or engineering careers. Yeah, right. And then now that I have some popularity, now I can make a video called how to prepare for a job interview. And I think if you type into that into YouTube, I'm the first video. Wow. Or how to teach yourself how to code, a very broad keyword. But since I have that authority now... Now I can rank as number one. And also the video is good too. The video can't be bad. Yeah, sure, sure. Did you use any tool for like the keyword research to find out that those were low competition keywords? No, I, all I did was I just typed those keywords into YouTube and saw my competition, kind of research what was currently out there. And so when I typed in mechanical engineer, there's a lot of, I guess, hype videos to encourage people to study mechanical engineering, but there's no videos talking about what it's really like. And so when I made my video, I knew I was going to be the first one. And that, that always helps to be fresh content. Okay. Is there something that you look for like in the competitor videos? Is there like, well, they're not targeting the same kind of person that I am or like their video is only 40 seconds long or like is there something on that where you're like, okay, this is something that I can, that I can target? Yeah, I think it, I just watch other people's videos and I look at keywords, say I'll look up aerospace engineering. And I'll see, okay, look, well, these are the current videos for aerospace engineering. They're kind of boring. Or there's just a lot of videos that are inaccurate. They're just not describing the careers accurately. So that's, I mean, that's always an easy thing to target. Is just grab someone, tell them like, yo, I want you to be honest about what it's like being an aerospace engineer, the good and the bad. And honestly, I'm usually the first person or the only YouTube channel that talks about the bad parts of each career. And I think people really appreciate that because 
they want to know what they're getting themselves into. They're going to be doing it for their whole career. Okay. And you're bringing other, you're bringing aerospace engineers on to talk about that, like in an interview format. Yeah. That's most of my channel. And then about once every four videos, I'll make a talking head channel where I, I talk about something. And recently I've been getting into like investing, <laughs> investing. So okay. Once every month or so, I'll make a video about investing. Okay, okay, that's a natural. I mean, that's kind of like in the in the realm of kind of career stuff, it, you know, on the personal finance side of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it resonates with my audience sometimes, but people take money very personally. So when you talk about money, it's like religion and politics. People take it so personal. So I got, I, I get heat for it, but I still think it's worth it. Yeah. Okay. So kind of targeting the SEO play at the beginning. P, what grew your channel at the beginning? I think my video grew originally just from kind of searching some of the more popular projects out there on YouTube and seeing that there wasn't, for instance, a video on doing a farmhouse dining table. And that was one of the most popular projects on all these different DIY websites. And so I made just a down to earth, really simple video on how to do that. And that was kind of my first one that snowballed and gained some traction. And then I kind of focused on concrete because that's kind of my background. And so I started making concrete videos on concrete counters and tables because that was a niche that hadn't been filled. And so I was able to rank pretty easily and come out up in the search results for those categories. So just, I think doing some research on what some of those projects that are the most popular, like on Pinterest and everything, and then just creating a video about it. That's what worked in the beginning. Okay. That's an interesting way to go. Kind of cross-referencing what's popular on websites, on Pinterest, but saying, okay, maybe it's not on YouTube yet. Maybe it's like a trend that just hasn't hit the YouTube universe yet. And then you said, focus on concrete. Like, did you pour concrete in a previous life, in a previous job? Like, what, what's that about? <laughs> so actually, I was watching the DIY network in college and kind of saw this new trend for concrete counters and decorative concrete, how it was real popular down south and in some other countries like Mexico and Argentina and those areas. And so I thought, wow, this is cool. You know, people can build their own countertops affordably. Yeah. And there's really not much content on it at all. And the content that was there was real dated or just wasn't real DIY friendly. And so I actually had a concrete business for two years back in the day. And so I took a lot of that knowledge that I had learned from that and then applied it into these different videos and just made it fun and DIY friendly and kind of broke it down step by step. So really anybody can create something out of concrete and they don't have to be an expert at it. They can, they can watch my videos and figure it out. Okay. Now, when you're playing the YouTube SEO game, like how are you converting those views into subscribers? Or is it just kind of a call to action at the end of the video or people like, dude, this guy's awesome. I got to check out the rest of his stuff. Well, for me, call to action has worked best at the beginning of the video. So a lot of times I'll just do a quick intro and say, you know, welcome to my channel. Here's what we're going to build today. Let's get started. But I'll always ask, if you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. So I try and do that before now because I've seen a lot better results as far as people jumping on as subscribers. Other things I do each and every month are contests on my website where I'll give away say $300 worth of tools. And then I'll, I'll make it so if they sign up, they have to go through these different steps. And one of them is to subscribe on YouTube and to join my email list and to do these different tasks. So giveaways have actually been a pretty good factor as well. And then I think okay. just people watching the videos and, you know, deciding they want to watch more. And so they'll subscribe, I guess. Okay. So there's, there is an element of email list building, at least for you, Matt, do you do the same thing? Like to try, try to drive people off of YouTube and onto an email list? I tried it before, but I don't have an email drip. So I have an email list and I, I try to drive people to it. But for me, the sales funnel has worked better when I just funnel people from we'll say a specific video like aerospace engineering to a money-making video. So I'll make a video that's what I call the content marketing. Like it's just content. And that's just with the intention of just getting views. You can lead it, see as like a lead generation. And then at the end of the video, I'll put an annotation or end card or just direct them to a money-making video. And so I find that to be a lot better process for me than the email, just because they're already on YouTube. And so they just kind of chain through the the videos and then they're like, oh, I want to buy this digital product that Matt sells once they get to the second video. 
Okay. Well, tell me about this, these these money videos. Like, so what's bringing the cash register for you on the Engineer Truth channel? About eighty percent of what I make, which is ten thousand dollars a month, comes from selling one course created by Seth Hims. It helps people get a job in digital marketing. It's called the Blueprint Digital Marketing Course. So yeah, about ten thousand dollars a month comes from that. And so he emailed me a year and a half ago asking me to promote it. And I was very skeptical at the time. So we did one interview and I just figured it's not going to sell anything. And oh, two weeks later, I checked my mail and I have a check from ClickBank, open it up and it's $300. And at the time that was a lot, I was surprised. Yeah. And so we kept doing that. And then two or three months later, someone emails us saying they got a job for $45,000 a year from the knowledge they got from the course. Wow. So, oh my gosh, we have to do a video testimony with this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a nice testimonial. Yeah, exactly. You know, what's funny is he he actually emailed us asking if he could do a video testimonial. <laughs> he wanted to do it because he's so happy. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, we did the video testimonial, but I wrapped it. This is the important part. I wrapped it in a story. So instead of titling it as uh, Video Testimonial 1 from Digital Marketing Blueprint, you know, this boring name, instead I titled it, actually the salary is $38,000. $38,000 salary in two months in digital marketing, no degree required. And so in that video, he just tells a story. And then as soon as we publish that video, our sales doubled. And so my strategy now is I'll post about seven regular videos, meaning I'm not trying to sell anything in them, okay. non-money-making videos. And then once every two months or once every eighth video or so, then I publish another testimonial. And that's pretty much how I, I make money. So then from my non-money-making videos, I'll funnel them to the money-making videos, which is basically just a video testimonial for the digital marketing course. Okay, okay. Does it stress you out to have 80% of your income coming from one product? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I do try to diversify. I try to promote different products. But honestly, nothing sticks. Nothing sticks as well as this one course. I mean, before this course started selling well, I, I probably tried to sell about 10 other courses and tried about 10 other monetization strategies. Yeah. And this one makes me significantly the most money. And I built a really close relationship with Seth. He, funny enough, he's actually here in the Philippines with me. I actually got him to come to the Philippines with me, okay. the creator of the course. And he's, his room is about like two doors down from mine. So we built up this really good friendship. So I'm not really worried about all of it coming from, from one source just because him and I are really good friends. And we both have our best interests in mind because we do a 50-50 split. So whatever I make, he makes. And, and we will obviously want to try to make more. Sure. All right. Fair enough. Well, I want to circle back on some of the, the monetization stuff in a minute. But I've got to ask John, what's grown the subscriber base this year? What do you think's tripled the subscriber base for you this year? A big one of that is the spray and pray approach. So the first year I really was, I was posting once a week and I was just putting up some of my favorite brands. And then I had one video that I covered a subscription service and that video was watched four times more than any of my other videos even combined. And I realized that the more I covered additional companies, the more I'd be found in search. And so that really played into the strategy. And so then this year, I was like, all right, I'm going to post every day. I'm going to post as many brands as I can because that's what people are interested in. And for me, it's you live and die by the machines. You live and die by the algorithm. And so the chances of my video getting put into a suggested video on a much larger channel related to fashion increase with the more videos I have and the more brands that I cover. Okay. And I can see that a lot of those are coming from much larger channels suggested as a video. People come over, they like the video and they stick around and subscribe. And so... To me, it's just about having that consistency because YouTube looks at my channel and says, all right, this guy's posting a lot of stuff. People watch his videos. We should recommend him more and just keeps the wheel churning. So what's an example of that? Like, hey, I got my Trunk Club subscription box and here's what was inside of it? Yeah, a lot of what I did, I mean, primarily when I started, I read a statistic about how many unboxing videos were on YouTube. It was like, even in 2014, it was like tens of thousands of videos. And when I went to look for, it was all in the women's space. So it was a lot of women doing shopping hauls, opening makeup boxes, and there really weren't many guys doing it, but there was a lot of companies popping up in that space that were providing subscriptions or new companies opening up clothes. And okay. To me, it was like, how do you know if a, if a product is good? Every company's going to tell you their product is good, but there was nobody. To me, what I really liked, one of my favorite sites is the wire cutter in the sweet home. 
and their approach to saying, all right, we got the best person in this industry to test out 10 leather gloves, and they're going to tell you which leather gloves to buy. And that's what I always found in myself trying to do is, all right, you want to sign up for a clothing subscription service, I'll tell you which one is the best out of the six that are out there, because I've already tried them all. And I know what the best value is, and which has the best customer service, because I've tried them all. And so okay, I try to take okay. that out with subscription boxes. And if you want a really good cashmere sweater, if you want really good shoes for a certain price. So that's really the, the trust that I've tried to build with my audience is about like, look, I don't take sponsored videos. I'm just trying to give you the best information I can. And then you have affiliate relationships with these brands, with these companies. How's the monetization look for you? Yeah. So I, a lot of the companies that have started as these like pure play e-com companies have, it's right on their website. When you sign up, they say, Hey, give your friend $25. We'll give you $25. And I started using those. So now I'm bringing in between four to $5,000 a month, just in affiliates through my channel because I am ranked so high. So I don't have a lot of subscribers, but I have a lot of people that find my videos, they watch them and then they go through the affiliate links. And right now what I'm trying to figure out is, is my revenue income gonna grow proportionately to my channel income? Because now that I do have a fairly sizable base in the menswear space, I'm getting a lot of offers for sponsored videos. I haven't really taken many of them. I've continued to do affiliates, but as a channel grows, I'd like to diversify out of just the affiliate space and start to do some more sponsored videos with not necessarily clothing brands, but uh, like I'd like to work with car companies or something bigger so that I could remain editorial independent for, for the clothing brands, but then also be able to support the channel. So you have four or five grand a month on the side. That's awesome. Yeah, that's my, that is my side hustle. I love it. I love it. Do you have the YouTube partner ads turned on like the AdSense ads? No, and I, I kind of laugh when I see a lot of this about the demonetization and everything because I've have never thought that people coming to watch my videos to learn about clothing need to spend a few seconds seeing an ad. And so I also know that you need much larger numbers in order to, to really see any significant income from it. So I've never even turned those on for my channel. And um, I still don't feel like I have to now that all of the ad apocalypse and the demonetization has happened. So now I'm not affected by that stuff. What's the ad apocalypse? I haven't heard about this. Several months ago, there was advertisers that were put in front of like ISIS videos. And then the media covered the fact that technically this company supported ISIS because Google ran ads on an ISIS video. And then YouTube oh, lost a bunch of advertisers. They all play saying, I can't be advertising if I don't know where my money's going. So YouTube introduced a new algorithm to look at what type of ads are running and what videos there are. And so now if your video is deemed inappropriate to certain audiences by YouTube's algorithm, they'll demonetize you. And people call that the apocalypse because a lot of channels saw overnight, they saw a reduction by 50 to 80% in revenue because half of their back catalog was taken ads off of, and that's their livelihood. Ouch. Yikes. Pete, are you running these YouTube ads or what's bringing the cash register for you? I still am doing the YouTube ads. Were you hit by apocalypse? I don't think so, so much. I mean, just with a little bit less consistent posting recently, my ad revenue's gone down. But at its highest point, it was 2000 a month. And right now it's about 13 to 1400 ish. And so that's not something I pay that much attention to. But right now, sponsorships are a, a big deal for me. And I'm, I just got a new home. And so I'm doing a big renovation project because it's an older home. And so working with brands like for the kitchen, I'm working with a national cabinet company, a company that's sponsoring all the appliances. So that's been a big deal. I also push a lot of affiliates and I have an email list of about 85,000 people. And that's been a big sales tool for me, just keeping people up to date on different projects and then letting them know about plans that they can download and items that, that might be a good fit for them if they're looking to start their own business in the DIY industry. Like if they're looking to sell some of their crafts, they can maybe get set up with an e-commerce store. And so I kind of recommend things like that. Okay. Yeah. And then I also I have a couple different courses that I'll push people to if I see it's a good fit for them. What are the courses about? One is about concrete counters. And then my other one is about building basically an online platform in the DIY industry. Oh, okay. Those do well. And then actually I found out about these ads on the website. I used to do like AdSense and I think it made a couple hundred dollars. And then I found out about these companies like Mediavine and AdThrive and I switched over to them. And now that makes between three to 5,000 per month just from these little ads that are on the website. So I think we all have a lot of different pieces of the pie that add up. Yeah. And so those are some that work for me. 
there's a lot going on there. Um, a lot to unpack. I'm curious, at what point did brands start reaching out to you in terms of the size of the channel? Or at what point did you feel comfortable reaching out to brands and say, hey, I have this channel, I'd love to do a sponsor video? When I had about 10,000 subscribers, Glid and Paint and NFL.com reached out to me and asked to partner for two videos. And that was a paid sponsorship, plus all the materials I needed. So that was my first sponsorship. And then as I've grown, especially once I got out over 75,000 to 100,000, then a lot more sponsors have come my way. And at least in the DIY industry, I can't even keep up with it. There's a lot of sponsors and I unfortunately don't have enough time to be able to work with everybody. But yeah, that's been a, a really good fit. And especially with renovations, man, I'm, I'm saving a ton of money and it's just a good fit all around. I love how you set up to do your entire home remodel as like a business write-off. What's the secret behind the 85,000 person email list? That's a gigantic number of subscribers. What are you using to incentivize people to sign up for the email list? To join my email list, my main drivers are my, a lot of my plans are free and those are my lead magnets. And so if somebody watches the video and they want to actually learn how to build the project, then they have to go to my website. And then from the website, they can then download the plans. The plans all are in just a automatic delivery program and they have the option to donate. So people can donate for the plans, but they are free if they enter a zero. And then all those people that download the plans, which comes to be about 200 per day on average, wow. then those all join my email list. I really like Pete's monetization. It's, it's everywhere. Everything is just so slick. Yeah, he's got, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like each slice of the pie. I love it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's fun to hear how everybody does it. You know, we all do it differently and there's definitely a lot of things I'm looking to learn how to improve on. And so it's fun to hear what all you guys are doing too. Well, I think the commonality is that none of us are relying on YouTube ad revenue. Mm -hmm. And so I made a video talking about how much I made and people didn't believe me because they they're saying, Oh, you don't get enough views to me banking 12,000 or $13,000 a month from YouTube. I actually even explained the video, like only 3000 comes from ad revenue and then 10,000 comes from selling that one course. And yeah. I get a couple hundred from a couple other affiliate related things. So when people see the views, you don't know how much of that YouTuber is making because each niche is worth a different amount. Like DIY niche, I could see a lot of potential for selling stuff because people have to buy the supplies, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of opportunity for information products because you're teaching people. And so when people consider how much a YouTube channel couldn't make, they got to consider that entertainment channels and political channels, they'd have to get 10 times, maybe 100 times more views to make the same kind of money. Than a teaching channel. Than a teaching channel. Yeah. A, a political channel could very potentially need about 100 times more views because anytime they put a political keyword in their title of their video or they talk about political stuff, YouTube will generally demonetize that now so they won't be able to monetize. And also, if you're a subscriber watching a political video, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to buy something from them. Unless it's kind of like a donate to support our cause or something like that. Plus, it's not, not as likely to be an evergreen topic as, hey, how to make a concrete countertop. It's going to be the same this year, the same as next year. How to, you know, is aeronautical engineering a good major? Hey, it's probably going to be the same for the foreseeable future. It's, you know, what happened in last night's debate is nobody cares next week, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would generally stay away from making a political channel or making an entertainment channel. Unless for entertainment, like you're really that funny. But the problem with being an entertainment channel is that you're really not going to inspire people to want to buy something from you because it's just like, oh, I'm entertained by you. Like, And what the most you could usually sell is a t-shirt, which, I mean, you're going to make like a couple bucks off per, per sale. It's, it's going to be tough to make a lot of money. And even when it comes to AdSense, I've learned that even just in the fashion space, if I do a video on watches, my ad rate on the video about watches is going to be almost twice that of something just like a typical fashion. So even within the niches, there's different rates for ads within those. And so like Matt's saying, if you're just a general audience, if you're just general comedy, you're going to need way more views than you would if you are in something like DIY, where you have advertisers that want to get out in front of those people because they're in a specific group of people. Interesting. John, are you getting any ideas from, from Pete or Matt on how to diversify that income pie? Oh my God. I would love to do more lead maggots. If I had the type of engine that Pete's got going over there, I'd be, uh, I'd be pretty jazzed, but that's really good stuff, Pete. So Pete, I was going to ask, what's the system on your website that's kind of like set up to deliver all of those? Like what's the behind the scenes tech? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of programs out there. I just came across, it was a recommendation from a friend. It's Gumroad and it's Nathan Barry who developed it. And I know he also has ConvertKit. And so I use 
both of those, like ConvertKit is my email platform. And then Gumroad, I like Gumroad because it gives you the ability to ask for a donation, which is kind of cool because it's just a lot of people, they feel bad for taking it for free or they just want to be able to say thanks, you know, like this really helped me. And so it gives them the option to donate if they want. What percentage of people do that? <laughs> <laughs> I would say less than 1%, but... Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's well, maybe a little bit more than that. Because you're like heavily advertising, like, hey, this is totally free. Just put zero in. But if you want to donate, you can. Absolutely. But I've had people that have given me $50 when I do get the donations. And the donations are anywhere between about 50 to 150 per day. And so it's usually like a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, or 15 sometimes 20. Yeah. So it just kind of varies. But that convert kit, basically, they put in their email, and it sends them the plans right away. And then they're on my email list. That's actually a genius way to do the lead magnet. So it's through Gumroad. And it's like, hey, this is free. But if you want to donate, if you found some value through the channel, hey, you can throw me a bone, you can add in a donation, suggested donation, whatever it is. I think that's a really good, smart way to do it. And then that connects to ConvertKit and then somebody's on the email. List. How often are you emailing everybody or is it more segmented than that? So I have some segments, like basically if people sign up, then they get some intro emails and then tools I recommend, projects they need to check out. I think that goes out once per week for those automated series. And then I email every time I do a new project. It generally turns out to be about every two weeks is when an email goes out. And it's really beneficial because just reminds people, hey, you know, I'm still here. There's still a website. There's projects to check out. And so it gets a lot more traffic back to the website. It gets more plans downloaded again. And it just kind of starts the snowball every time I send out that email. Yeah. Start the snowball rolling. Because it. my understanding is like, especially as soon as you hit publish, if you can get a bunch of views, especially complete views, and I even read something was if you can get people to like and comment and watch all the way to the end, like as soon as you hit publish, then that's going to play well to that video in the algorithm. And it sounds like with an email list of 80,000 people, you got a, you know, a built-in advantage over somebody who's, who's brand new. Now, John, have you seen similar, like when, with your videos, like do you ask your existing fan base to do anything to try and boost them up in SEO? Or it's like, hey, I'm publishing every day. I can't make that ask. One of the biggest things, and I've seen this on my own videos, is it's the engagement. But if a video, if I have two videos, one has a thousand views and four comments, one has a thousand views and 50 comments, the one with more comments is going to get pushed more by the algorithm. And I, I've seen that directly in, on a ton of my videos. And so usually I'll just ask a question in the video of just like, do you like this brand? What do you have questions about the product? And so I'm not crazy about asking specifically like, hey, just comment for comment's sake. I usually try and ask for something that I can also learn from. So, you know, one of my most valuable videos now is I was doing a giveaway and I just said, hey, let me know what you want me to cover in the next year. Okay. And I've got almost a thousand comments on that video. So I have like a almost a one in two comment rate on that video and it's been pushed out there a lot. And I also am learning a ton from, I like to call it my hive mind. It's like the wisdom of crowds type of thing where yeah, that's awesome. I get a lot of brand recommendations and video ideas. They all come right from comments. You ever gone back and deleted a video and said, this one is just not performing. I want to redo it just to see what would happen. No, I have a few that I could think of that I'd probably delete, but no, I don't think it really drags down the channel that much. Matt, what about you going back to 2011? Are there some early embarrassing videos that you have gotten rid of? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so in the beginning, I was still finding my niche. And so I experimented. I think I made some dating advice videos back in the day. So that's how to go. Plus also, it doesn't help that I think any dating advice gets demonetized. Okay. So I think any dating channel out there is going to have a, have a tough time. I look back and I deleted everything that was not career related. And I think I've left all the career related stuff on there and then also i deleted some of the live streams so once in a while i'll just live stream with my audience and i'll just chat with them just to talk with my <laughs> the people that the subscribers that really care enough to to chime in live and some of those uh, i'll delete right away because you know they're the value in in those is that they're live and so not a lot of people watch them after they're not live anymore oh okay i, I should ask you guys about the live um element to it like do you record anything for facebook live and repurpose to youtube I tried to do a Facebook Live once and I got, I think I got a total of two viewers. So I stopped doing that. <laughs> so so uh, now I just go live on YouTube. I don't think it's a requirement at all for any YouTuber. I, in some ways, it could actually hurt your channel because the quality on a live stream is not as not as high. Yeah. 
but I just find that it's for my audience, they like to talk to me like once in a while and also ask questions. And that's the most important part is like they could ask questions and then get a direct answer for me. And I feel like it makes them feel a lot more connected to me as a person. Yeah. It's like, here's office hours with Matt. That makes sense. John, you ever do like a live unboxing or you want to you only publish the kind of like the polished finished product videos? No, I do try and go live about once a month. And it's the same thing where I try to do more Q and A because it is that live thing. And then those are ones I usually don't leave up on the channel for the same reason. I mean, if people miss it, I usually leave it up for a day or so, so people can find it, watch it if they want to. But that live engagement is all just about relationship building and making your audience feel connected, which I feel connected through the comments, but even more so whenever I'm able to directly interact with them on the live streams. Okay. And then you delete that one after a couple of days? Yeah, I think I think they're just unlisted on my channel. I usually don't delete them. Okay, I'm like a digital pack rat. I mean, you should. I have hard drives, hard drives <laughs> full of stuff. It's just, it's not good. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, I think building trust is so big for influencers because so many influencers are like, "Hey, look at my Lamborghini." <laughs> the first time you ever see me is through a Facebook ad, especially for a knowledgeable audience or a younger audience who's in tune with how Facebook and YouTube work and with advertising. If the first time someone sees you is through a Facebook ad, I think it auto like automatically builds untrust. Yeah, untrust it already, already makes you seem untrustworthy, and so I think people like to find you first, either through a referral or through their own searching, and then if they see a Facebook ad of you, it makes more sense. And so it's with that live streaming with someone and talking with them, there's nothing to hide behind. There's no editing to hide behind. There's no retakes. This is you live, and when people get to see you being live. It builds up a lot of trust. And I think that's that's when it's a lot easier to get people through a funnel. Yeah, that's why it's scary to do live stuff. <laughs> I want to go back and edit it afterwards. Very good, guys. Again, I'm joined by John Shanahan from The Cavalier. It's thecavalier.net. You can find him on YouTube as well. Pete Sven from DIY Pete and DIYPete.com. And Matt Tran from Engineer to Truth on YouTube, Engineer to Truth. Dot com. Let's wrap this thing up with you guys. Number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. It doesn't have to be YouTube related. Let's kick off with John. Whatever you want to do, if it's a YouTube channel, if you want to start a craft, if you want to take one of Pete's courses, whatever you want to do, if you have the idea, just start doing it and don't delay. Like Anybody can put up unboxing videos on YouTube and there's a lot of people that probably thought of doing it. But because I pulled out my iPhone, I sat in my room and I just started doing it. Then it got into a rhythm and then I started to improve a little bit and I'm just about as good as I was when I started. But because I now have this library and this trust, if I never would have posted that first video, then it would still be an idea in my head and it wouldn't be this awesome way to build out my wardrobe and, and have a really cool audience. So I think whatever you have this idea of doing, just start trying to do it and then you'll get feedback and then you'll figure out if it's right or not. But for me, it's just start right now. I love it. Who would have thought unboxing videos would be such a thing, but way to, <laughs> way to jump on it. Pete, what about you? For me, I just find we all get caught up day to day with all of our different tasks we need to do and things that we have going on. And for me, it's just been important to schedule an afternoon once a week to just go out and do something I enjoy. And so for me, that's either going skiing or snowmobiling or out for a run. But I, I just think it's important to make sure that you have your own me time so that when we're all so busy, we minimize that stress and still have fun doing what we're doing because YouTube does take a lot of work. So just make sure you're putting in and blocking out time for yourself. Sounds good. Matt, bring us home. If you can, I would target a demographic that has money. Like in John's case, like luxury watches. I think that's, if you're targeting that niche, it's going to be a lot easier to make money. If you're going to target some audience like kids, it's going to be tough to get any kind of sales through affiliate cuts. I do think you want to target a demographic that has money if, if you can and more money, the better. So if you could target like entrepreneurs or high end stuff, I think is this easier to make money? And then second thing is if you could do video, honestly, I think video has so much power in it that I think if you're trying to be an influencer, video is just, it just has an advantage. Sounds good, guys. Thank you so much for joining me and we'll catch up with you soon. This edition of The Side Hustle Show is brought to you by Skillshare.com, the online learning community with more than 17,000 classes. By listening to the show, you're already investing your time and energy in improving your entrepreneurial education, so I think this is going to be right up your alley. On Skillshare, you can learn everything from video editing to social media marketing to mobile photography and videography. There's a huge variety of subject matter on pretty much anything you'd want to learn, and it's all taught by practicing experts. I think you'll find the bite-sized classes are perfect for professionals who want to advance their career and for side hustlers who want to expand the skills you need to grow your business. 
How it works is you get unlimited access to all these classes for a low monthly price. Never have to pay per class again. It's kind of like Netflix, only for something that'll actually help your business. For example, I'm trying to step up my podcast hosting game, so I'm checking out a few classes on audio production and presentation. It's all on demand, and the catalog has some pretty awesome stuff. Now, here's the best part. Side Hustle Show listeners can try Skillshare absolutely free. I think you're going to love it. Go to Skillshare.com slash side hustle to redeem your free month. That's Skillshare.com slash side hustle for a free month of unlimited access. All right. My top takeaways from this interview with John, Pete, and Matt. Number one is to think keywords. Each of the panelists found their first viewers through YouTube search, or rather, I should say their first viewers found them through YouTube search. So that means thinking strategically about what gap your video fills in the current search results, what keywords people are going to type in to find you. And to be sure, there's going to be competition, but there's always new niches opening up and there's always going to be a unique angle that you can bring to the table. So that's takeaway number one, think keywords. Number two is to think next steps for your viewers. This was the key to the cash flow for, uh, for my panelists, whether it was recommending products as an affiliate, driving them to the next relevant video, like Matt called it, the money videos, or inviting them to download the, the project plan and thereby you know joining your email list. There's always some call to action in creating content with that call to action in mind, even if it's just, you know, subscribe to the channel for more or leave a comment below. I think that sets you up for better results. And I think it makes you look uh, to your viewers like you've got your act together. So takeaway number two, think of the next steps for your viewers. And takeaway number three is to engage with the audience. I really liked John's tips about asking for comments and feedback during his video, not only to fuel his content for future videos, hey, what would you guys like me to cover, but also to send a really nice signal to the YouTube algorithm that, look, this is something that people are really engaging with. And I think it's the same reason um, these guys said they were doing YouTube Live or even Facebook Lives for that one-on-one interaction, building that relationship with that audience. Lots of great advice in this one. And a big thank you to all three of the panelists for taking time out of their day to join me. If you visit SideHustleNation.com slash YouTube panel, you'll find the full show notes and links to all the resources mentioned. And you'll also be able to download the free PDF highlight reel summary of our call. But that's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show for a uh, Where Are They Now episode with a former guest of mine who's taken his simple buy low, sell high Amazon FBA business to really surprising new heights. You don't want to miss it. Hit the subscribe button in your podcast player app and I'll see you then. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com. 